Things had been tense between the British and Majertin Sultanate before the Suez Canal was opened in 1869. But with the opening of the canal, things only got worse between the two. Other European nations also began to make themselves known in the region, and Majartin ports suddenly had steamers from all over the world passing by. With this came shipwrecks, and every wreck seemed to sour relations between Europe and the Majartin Sultanate even more. But a ship was about to make things even more complex. Hello, and welcome to the Shipwreck Archive. Thank you. Would you happen to have the story, Yusuf Ali Claims the Mekong? Here we are. Enjoy! Captain Foch would later explain to a board of inquiry that, due to fog, he had lost any idea of the position of his ship as they had traveled along the Horn of Africa. The shoreline was low, and with the thick fog, he thought that what he was seeing was Gardafui, when what he was actually seeing was higher terrain inland. It was a mistake that would bring them to the shore of Raz Hafun, traveling at a speed of 13 knots. The Mekong grounded between midnight and 1 a.m. on Monday the 17th of June, 1877, with most of the passengers, who numbered between 66 and 100, depending on the source, having been asleep. Two accounts of the wreck that were written by passengers were later published in the papers, and the two are distinctly different enough to make note of both. One of them, a female passenger, would take the opportunity of telling the story of the grounding to take one final jab at the ship's stewards. In her account, she said that they had already been awake because their mattress had been getting wet since the steward had failed to close their porthole. She had not enjoyed the food or the service for the trip up to this point, and would say that other passengers agreed with her, but they resisted complaining because the ship's captain and purser were both so pleasant that they did not want to cause them problems. Her lack of sleep was not universal, and another passenger, who was only identified as having gotten on board the ship in Singapore, said that he had been asleep in the stern of the saloon when he was awakened by the sound of the engine suddenly going full astern. Knowing that something must be the matter, he rushed to the deck just in time for the impact. The ship had enough forward momentum that there were a couple more shocks as she drove forward into the sandy beach, becoming firmly grounded on an even keel. He was relieved to see that there was no immediate danger. The ship was not going to be able to move from where it was grounded, but the seas were calm enough that there was no chance of the ship being broken up quickly either, and she was in no danger of sinking since she was hard aground in very shallow water, only about 40 yards from shore. For the people on board the ship who had not woken up when they had attempted to reverse the ship, the experience was much more jarring. Most of them were fast asleep until the first shock of running aground, and as they attempted to get up and see what had happened, the continued shocks knocked them off their feet. It was a recipe for chaos below decks, until those who understood what had happened calmed those who did not yet understand. Some people, it was called out by the passenger that they were all men, and that the women and children remained perfectly calm, did rush to the deck and behave frantically, but there was no rushing the crew, who were doing their best to determine the safest course of action. The unnamed female passenger's account speaks of the matter somewhat differently, saying that the crew had panicked and that it had taken a great effort from both the captain and the purser to calm them down and stop them from jumping into the water and abandoning the ship entirely. It is not entirely certain how she is able to determine this, as she describes it as occurring on the bridge 
While she describes herself as being in her cabin, clutching her children and shaking too badly to even fasten their life belts around them. She also blames the first mate for the accident, saying that he was the officer on deck, and describing him as old and with weak eyesight. This claim is not backed up by any other source, including the captain who described the grounding, as well as the reasons behind it, while making it clear that he was the one responsible. Perhaps she also thought this to a small extent, since she is also quick to say that the captain was also nearsighted, in a way that suggests that no blame lays with someone who she was clearly fond of by the rest of her account. Everyone on board was soon equipped with life belts, and about an hour after the ship had struck land, a boat was sent to the shore with a rope to connect to the ship in case they needed to evacuate. Though it was not sent without incident, and the first attempt lost both an officer and one of the sailors when the boat upturned. It was still dark, and though they could evacuate, Captain Foch thought it would be safer to wait until daylight. They were also hopeful that they would see another steamer that they had passed on Sunday if they waited and summon her for aid. Around four in the morning, they did spot the lights of another steamer and signaled to her, and then an officer rode over to speak with them. He came back exhausted, but with the good news that the ship was willing to help them. The newcomer also sent over their second officer to make a plan of rescue. This must have been a relief to the passengers. Over the past four hours, the surf had become a little rougher, and the water began to wash over the ship and come through the skylights, to the discomfort of the passengers. The captain of the newly arrived steamer, the British cargo steamer, the Glenarty, was not willing to risk the ship's boats and men in this rough surf and certainly could not get closer to them without endangering his own ship. It was therefore decided through telegraph that the best course of action would be for the Glenarty to go around to the lee of Cape Gardafui and lay an anchor there, while the passengers and crew of the Mekong were to go to the shore and walk by land to where the Glenarty was going to be anchored. This was agreed on as the safest course of action especially in light of the boat that had already capsized and cost lives. The evacuation of the ship is something that both passengers agree went very smoothly, with the sailors, officers, and passengers on shore doing everything they could to aid in the safe landing of people from the ship. This included passengers who were strong swimmers, picking up the children and carrying them on the boat ride to the shore just in case of an accident, to ensure that the children would be saved. Once they got close to shore, the people were handed over the side and into the surf to wade the rest of the way, while the boat headed back to pick up more people. The shipwreck and the evacuation of the ship could not escape the notice of the local population, and a group of armed men began to gather near where the survivors of the shipwreck were coming to shore under the command of the ambitious Yusuf Ali. The female passenger would say that they were asked to hand over their valuables very politely. But as the people were asking were armed, there was little argument to be had. She would claim that they were protected by a treaty that had been signed recently, protecting their lives. But no one seems willing to have tested it in practice. They would abandon the ship and its goods entirely and the passengers and the crew would walk away unhindered and unharmed. The female passenger even says that on seeing her purse in the hands of one of the men belonging to Yusuf Ali as he came to shore, she demanded it, and it was given back to her, though all of the valuables from it were already gone. She also levels the accusation that the ship's stewards took the opportunity to steal from the passengers' cabins and that they were arrested once they got into a port, but there is no other reference to this elsewhere. As it was, once the passengers were all on shore and the crew had begun to evacuate, the forward cabins of the ship were already being ransacked for what could be taken even though the water had now risen fairly high in the ship.
Once everyone was on shore, around noon that day, Captain Foch, who had been the last on board, had the unpleasant duty to tell everyone that they would not be able to save the luggage. He had saved some weapons in the evacuation, but did not have any ammunition, and it was his primary duty to ensure everyone was safe. While it had been his intention to make a camp for the night and then unload the luggage and arrange transportation to the Glenarty, this was no longer possible, and they were going to have to abandon everything and make the trip of about eight miles immediately. Captain Gulland of the Glenarty and some of his officers who had arrived by walking over land at this point to offer their assistance agreed with Captain Foch's assessment as to the situation. This was a shock to most of the passengers, who had been told not to burden themselves, since the ship was not breaking up fast, so the luggage could be saved. Some of the passengers had money that they had not left on the ship, and one man had managed to conceal a bag of diamonds around his neck that had not been noticed by Yusuf Ali's men, but they were leaving the Mekong with very little. The shores that the Mekong had wrecked on were politically tense as European powers struggled with local rulers for control. The wreck of the Mekong was about to make the entire situation even more complicated. Yusuf Ali was born in Alula, the capital of the Majartinia Sultanate, and had grown up as a sailor on his father's sambuks. Eventually, he was able to buy sambuks of his own and set himself up as a captain as well as a merchant. As such, he already had a decent amount of power in the area, and had become governor of Alula when the Mekong washed up on shore as a perfect opportunity. As the passengers and crew of the Mekong trekked across the sand for what would prove to be a three-hour walk to the Glenarty, the future was looking bright for Yusuf Ali, who discovered the Mekong's safe, still full of money and valuables. For the passengers of the Mekong, things were less pleasant. As the day went on, it got hotter, and many of the people who had evacuated the Mekong were not dressed for these conditions. Some of the children were still in their pajamas. Many of them, passengers and crew alike, were not wearing shoes on the scorching sand. Captain Gulland and his men led the way back to their ship with the people who could not walk well being assisted and the sailors carrying the children. Even with this assistance, one of the passengers collapsed due to the heat and exhaustion and never regained consciousness. They were forced to bury him in the sand. The ship's purser soon followed. Once on board the Glenarty, the members of the crew gave up their cabins to the shipwrecked passengers and did their best to make them comfortable until they could be brought into the port of Aden. Here, they all arrived in a disarray of clothing pieced together from what they had been wearing when the ship wrecked, and what the men of the Glenarty had been able to spare. It was an image that inspired sympathy in the port of Aden, and soon, doors opened for them. Many of them had effects from their unprotected and unexpected walk through the desert that required medical attention. The passengers could not say enough in praise of Captain Golland and the willingness to make the difficult walk across the Cape, not once, but twice. Also, his willingness to join them even when they were faced with armed men, and his hospitality on board the ship. A medal was soon awarded to him for his efforts in saving the passengers and crew of the Mekong in spite of his protests, that he had only done as expected. The passengers in some cases were much harder to Captain Foch when they spoke to the papers, but these complaints were soon addressed in the papers by the Massagery's Many Times line representative, who simply stated that they felt that Captain Foch had done exactly what was right by not trying to defend the ship and risk lives. They dismissed the people who were complaining about his actions, and those of his crew, as people who were simply angry about the loss of their luggage. There was a code observed in the Mezertine Sultanate, 
mostly due to the large number of shipwrecks that had happened on their shore, that a portion of anything salvaged from the shipwreck had to be given to the ruler of Majatin. In this case, Uthman Mahmud Yusuf. This was something that Yusuf Ali was not willing to do. And Uthman Mahmud Yusuf lay siege to Alula. He also burned all of Yusuf Ali's sambuks that were in port. Yusuf Ali was well prepared for such an attack and did not bend this show of force, bringing the Majartin Sultanate to the brink of civil war. Not willing to go that far, Uthman Mahmud Yusuf relinquished his rights of salvage to the Mekong. Something that was easier to do since, by now, the Mekong was deep underwater and past salvage. It would be a large boost for the power of Yusuf Ali in the region, where it has been argued that, at the time, piracy was used as a valuable tool of diplomacy. Since the Mekong had been a French vessel, the French government was soon threatening to assert authority over the region, which made the British uncomfortable enough that they had the Egyptian government reassert their authority over the area. This, admittedly, mostly proved to be for show, with Alula choosing when they wanted to fly the Egyptian flag and when it was more convenient for them to not. There also began talks of placing a lighthouse on the Cape, especially after a British steamer named the Kashmir grounded not long after, also because of the low shore and heavy fog. This would be a long time coming, however, and involved more people taking control of the area only to be forced out. There did prove to be a reason to go in search of the Mekong, however, one that had not interested Yusuf Ali in 1877, as part of the cargo of the Mekong was the Cham collection. Dr. Claude Albert Maurice had been attached as a doctor for the French consulate in Tainay, and he became fascinated with the pieces of statuary and ancient temples he found in what had once been the heart of the kingdom of Vijaya. He collected a group of statues that had once decorated the Cham temples, but after he passed while still in Vietnam in 1877, no one was certain what happened to this collection. That was, until researchers in the 1970s discovered evidence that the statues had been on the Mekong. In 1995, an expedition set out to find the Cham pieces that had been lost on the Mekong, suspecting that the pieces had been too heavy to be of interest when taking items off of a sinking ship. They did have to contend with eight potential shipwrecks that could be the Mekong, evidence of a dangerous nature of the shore. But the description of where and how the ship had sank was very detailed, and they were soon bringing plates to the surface that read Massageries Imperials. In total, the expedition was able to pull 18 statues to the surface from the sunken ship. A valuable, if long neglected, piece of history. For more information, please see The Loss of the Mekong in the Singapore Daily Times from the 16th of July, 1877, or see our other sources in the description below. Thank you for listening. Thank you for visiting the Shipwreck Archives. See you soon.